to another of the post-coronavirus sociological theory lectures. Um, this is going to be um, a walk through Sigmund Freud's uh, Totem and Taboo. And we'll probably only get to the first two chapters in this recording, and then I'll do another one probably early next week on the rest of the book. Um, we're going to be using um, sort of the standard edition, the Norton edition of, uh, of Totem and Taboo. It's the one I use for my students. So the, the, uh, the page numbers will correspond uh, to this. I've worked my way through probably five copies of this book over the years, and uh, this one's already starting to get kind of unreadable. It, to me, has been one of the most important uh, texts I've read, and um, it, it's kind of hard to, con to convince other people of that, but uh, um, I, I, I've really been influenced a lot by Freud, and um, you know, I think that the greatest book he wrote was The uh, Interpretation of Dreams. It's a book that's almost unteachable today, but it's one of the bravest documents ever constructed, if you've ever taken a look at, at it. Um, the man reveals so much about his own uh, background, his own psychic structure, uh, his own unconscious desires, and so on. And, and a, it's, it's just an amazing document, and he really does, it strikes me, uh, discover the unconscious and the way that the unconscious functions. Right, before we get into Freud himself, I sort of want to tell you a little bit about what's at stake and why I think this book is so important. So I'm going to uh, be using, um, for a few moments, I'd like to talk about Erica Mann, Thomas Mann's daughter, um, who uh, wrote a book in the 1930s called School for Barbarians, Education Under the Nazis. So as uh, you know, her father and, and, um, and she herself had to flee uh, the Nazis, um, had a terrible time uh, getting away, had to abandon a lot of their property, some of their, uh, some of their manuscripts. You know, and then Man, Man wound up in, um, um, in California. He wrote um, a you know, book I've written about, um, you know, uh, Dr. Faustus while there, and uh, other books he was working on as well. But, but anyway, um, uh, Erica was writing about, um, you know, really the transformation of society under the Nazis. And there are parallels between what she's writing about then um, in the 1930s and what is going on now. So I think that, you know, this book was originally, yeah, it's published in English at least in 1938. It probably was only published in English. Um, so she's walking through some of the changes, especially in childhood socialization and in education in particular and uh, under the uh, Nazis. And so you get about page 77, and she has a section on racial instruction. And um, so she's talking about how important it is to get people to understand uh, race, racism, uh, eugenics, essentially, the glories of the Aryan uh, peoples and the uh, you know downside of the Jews, basically. Um, and so there's lots in there about that. She talks about how, um, you know, um, oh, let's just, well, we'll skip this just to get to, to the key things. But she writes about uh, a textbook called The ABCs of Race. And I happen to find a um, copy of this um, online. Um, so here's the original sort of um, book cover for this from 1935. So clearly, you know, a Nazi era uh, ABC book. And, um, um, it portrays a big-nosed Jew, but protects itself this way. Of course, we must not confuse a purely external expression with race. Race means soul, and there are men who do, as a matter of fact, show some Nordic traits, but they are Jews in spirit. And then the ABC outlines Germany's four great problems. One, Germany has too little territory because of the loss of her colonies. Two, one-third of her population lives in exile. Three, the menace of the Jews, a mixture of Asiatic and Negro blood with a tiny amount of European, European blood. And then fourth, the falling birth rate, which is going to be really important in just a moment here. So then so, uh, she goes on about how important it is to, to understand that the Jews are our misfortune. You know, this is, again, part of the educational system. Uh, the only good thing the Jew has is his white collar. Jesus once said to the Jews, your father is not God, but the devil. The Jews have a wicked book of law, the Talmud. Jews see the animal and us, treat us accordingly, and so on. So, um, so what I want you to see is that in Nazi education, you have two things going on. You have the construction of a positive figure of veneration. 
the German people, the Aryan soul, uh, or Hitler himself, or the Nazi regime, right? So these are all sort of totemic figures that are consciously honored, revered, venerated, and that the Nazi education system was all about promoting that. On the other hand, you have the construction of a kind of negative totem uh, in the form of the Jew uh, or the liberal or, um, uh, um, well, we'll just go with those two, that, you know, those who oppose uh, the Nazi regime, the en enemies of the Nazis. Um, you know, they're parasites. They are rich and fat and stupid and so on. And that, you know, that uh, our job is to get rid of them. Well, what I really like about her discussion of race and racial education is that then immediately jumps into religion. And uh, religion studying the Third Reich has no meaning. Um, and uh, so it goes on to describe how um, Nazis overlaid um, essentially God and Jesus with, uh, with Hitler. And with the Nazis, I'm going to try to make this closer so you can see this here. Um, every class in Roman Catholicism opens with the formula, Heil Hitler, blessed be Jesus Christ in all eternity, amen. And then closes with, blessed be Jesus Christ in all eternity, amen, Heil Hitler. The sequence sandwiching everything else between Heils is enforced by an edict of January 5th, 1934. The Protestants do the same thing. Um, and then, um, in the, you know, the evangelicals, you know, basically Lutheran church within uh, Germany, um, the existence of our people and their racial peculiarity has been willed by God. And that is an act of unfaithfulness towards God if racial values are not considered or if they are destroyed. And then, um, uh, yeah, and then, again, sort of, again, an overlay of German uh, people with Nazism um, you know, overlay here where that, you know, Christian tradition, religion and race is the content of the plans for education that include religion. Uh, Germanic faith in God and the Christian mission, the Savior, the ideals of the monks, the knights, and so on. Again, overlaying Nazis with God, with Jesus. Um, yeah. Um, let me see. The 20 questions um, game in religion Uh who children is it in these days who most reminds us of Jesus through his love of humble people and his readiness for self-sacrifice? The answer is the Fuhrer. Who most reminds us of the disciples because of their loyal attachment to the Fuhrer? Captain Gehrig, Dr. Goebbels, and before the bloodbath, Captain Rome, right? One teacher went further. The pupils in the public school in, in von Queen Louise's school had to copy this credo from the blackboard. I believe in Germany. God's other beloved son, master of his own self, conceived under the Nordic heavens, born between the Alps and the sea, suffered under Papus and Mammonus, uh, you know, money makers, and calumniated, beaten, and thrust into misery, tempted into hell by devils of all sorts after decades of poverty and affliction, risen again from the national death into Eckhart's box and Goethe's world of the spirit, where he sitteth at the side of his brother of Nazareth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. So you have a kind of perverse reconstruction of the Apostles' Creed here, right? Um, yeah, so uh, again, it goes on. Um, the Fatherland sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, it's tough to read this. Um, Participants left, uh, oh yeah, yeah, that, that paganism as well as Christianity is being reborn and that, and that Nazism is creating sort of this new admixture of the pagan and the Christian. And so the reconstruction of sort of this, that you know, the winter solstice, excuse me, the winter solstice and the summer, um, uh, uh, the summer solstice uh, festivals, you know, leaping over fires and so on. Um, yeah, um, let's see here. Um Oh, yeah. And uh, fantasies about the sexual aberrations that are going on among um, um, mainstream religion as a way to sort of take religion back away from even the Catholic Church. Right. So it was priests. So there was sort of as there is now a kind of um, a kind of um, uh, emphasis in in uh, political circles, at least among uh, upon sort of like pedophilia and sex crimes and so on. Uh, and so there was, uh, you know, um, 
you know, a sort of attack on that. That was part of this uh, uh, paradigm. But, but the idea is that um, religion and then that God and the Nazis, Jesus and, and Hitler, were overlaid on each other. Um, and then at the end of the book, she starts talking about girls to German girls and about sexual education. And one of the things that she makes really important is that every healthy child of a German mother means one more battle won in the fight for existence of the German people. And so in an ethical sense, it is impossible to deny to the unmarried German wo woman the right to become a mother. So again, anti-birth control is going to be crucial here, a kind of obligation to give birth to fill up um, uh, the country with, with young Aryan children and so on. The German Reich of the future will have to regard the childless woman, regardless of whether or not she is married, as an incomplete member of the National Commonwealth. A little bit further on again, the state will have, uh, because the race is going to go into decay or the real German is going to go into decay, uh, every reasonably constructed state will have to regard a woman who has not given birth as dishonored. There are plenty of willing and qualified youths ready to unite with the girls and women on hand. Fortunately, one, bo one boy of good race suffices for 20 girls. And the girls, for their part, would gladly fulfill the demand for children uh, were not for the nonsensical so-called civilization of the monogamous permanent marriage. So um, actually, you know, it's sort of like, uh, uh, you know, getting rid of even even that notion, which is sort of, you know, part of the, the pen swing of the Republican Party sort of supposedly defending, um, you know, conservative marriage. But but at any rate, I, I just want to give you a sense of what's at stake and some of the themes that were alive and in the air at the time that Freud was writing and that found a kind of bizarre and kind of um, uh, dark uh, combine in uh, Nazi ideology. So it's it's notions of race, notions of, of patriarchal gender, a kind of control of women's sexuality to promote childbearing and childbirth, not for the woman's best interest, but for, for some state purpose of some kind. Um, again, an overlay of the state with, uh, with religion, an overlay of, of the Nazi party with, with Christianity, an overlay of Jesus of Nazareth with, uh, with Adolf Hitler of, of, um, of Austria, right? And so you get this, this strange intermixing of politics, economics, and religion uh, with, with racialization and sexual oppression and all kinds of other things mixed in. These are all themes that Freud is writing about. So Freud is, is um, you know, um, directly trying to comprehend um, the way that society um, structures human subjectivity and um, and and he was really interested towards the end of his life, not just in treating patients, although he never lost interest in that, but also in sort of interpreting culture. And Totem and Taboo is one of his most um, remarkable essays. I find it very powerful, where he's taking some of the lessons that he's learned about the structure of the human psyche, and in particular about the way in which the human individual is grabbed by society, or um, or, or or the way that the that the primate is essentially um, reconstructed, overwritten by society so that we become human beings in the way that, that we know. So, so in, es in essence, what Freud's work does is tell us what happens to the human uh, psychic apparatus, to our soul, which is what psyche is, to our soul, um, to our consciousness, uh, to our conscious and conscious selves, right? as a result of being inserted in a particular form of society. Now, all societies share qualities and characteristics, and the unconscious, the thing that's in us, that is society, right, is something that is um, that shares traits and qualities regardless of the exact society that you're in. But there were very particular uh, qualities that Freud saw uh, uh, manifest in his time and that he wrote about, uh, you know, from this point forward. Um, again, sort of, you know, something along the lines of rising authoritarianism, something along the lines of a, of a, of a very, um, again, he's writing about it in Totem and Taboo, this bizarre ambivalent relationship that human beings have towards authority figures, that there's a love for authority that is sometimes ignited and made strong and actually made um, uh, perverse or dangerous. Um, when it's intermixed with repressed uh, desire for freedom, 
or repressed envy. In other words, Freud is going to tell us that some of the moments when, when masses of human beings bow down with great um, um, submission to an authoritarian leader, that this occurs among the very people whose freedoms are being trampled and at the very times when their freedoms are vanishing most completely. And his argument is going to be that, 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 that when one is envious, that one's, when one's drives and desires have been repressed, that that energy that is unconsciously sort of uh, uh, structured and framed winds up inverted and projected outwards onto an authority figure as, as veneration, as honor, as worship. In other words, the very authority figures that repress us can become honored and 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 um, uh, obeyed with great fervor as the um, feelings of of denial of envy of of again of unlived life right fuel um, a kind of a projection outward and an inversion of those feelings into into love so we've got a lot to talk about but 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 I but I I guess in a nutshell, Freud is really good at providing us with a way to understand what seems incomprehensible, incomprehensible, a way to make sense of senseless human conduct, or maybe put another way, of providing reason to explain unreasonable submission to unjust authority. Okay, so again, he was writing before the Nazis, although he was forced to leave and kept writing after the Nazis took over. But, but he's trying to make sense of this bizarre desire to submit to sadistic power, right? There's other things going on here, but that's one of the things that comes out most strongly. Okay, so what we're going to do then, we're going to walk through um, a little bit. We're going to do a, a quick introduction to Freud. Uh, we're going to talk about the two big concepts in the book, Totem and Taboo. They're right in the title. Uh, we're going to talk about the primary case that he analyzes in the book, these sort of so-called primitive or savage societies, especially, um, you know, the peoples of Australia that were uh, studied by Spencer and Gillen. And then we're going to jump right away into the first chapter on the horrors of incest and the second chapter on, on emotional ambivalence, okay, and, and its relationship to power and authority. Okay, so, um, yeah, so let's very quickly then, let's sort of jump into sort of a, a quick understanding of Freud or background onto Freud. Okay, so Freud, Freud basically, here's a little image that I use for my undergraduates usually, is that, uh, so Freud developed uh, this treatment technique to deal with uh, people who were exhibiting uh, symptoms of mental illness. Um, in fact, he, most of his early cases were cases of, of somatic illness, body illness, somaticized, in, in, in other words, people were exhibiting illnesses, psychosomatic illnesses, that couldn't be traced to any organic causes. And in Freud and his colleague Joseph Brewer wound up developing the talking cure, actually wasn't their name, it was one of their patients gave it a name, right? The talking cure. And what they found out was, is that, is that at moments, the symptoms of, uh, what he found was that at least some of his women patients had symptoms that were caused by repressed desire. Sometimes repressed hate, sometimes repressed love, and that the the um, that there was a kind of conflict set up in the mind where the love that one had, say, for a father, and the hatred that one had for the father, or put another way, the reverence that one had, the asexual reverence that one had for a father, and the kind of unconscious desire that one might have had for a father. Right? These these two opposed, contradictory um, feeling states were separated in the mind. And therefore couldn't directly influence each other. And it led to the part of the feeling state that was unconscious, that wasn't available to consciousness, having tremendous impact upon the life of the analysand. But it was like it was because it was unconscious, these ideas, these feelings, these fantasies, these these symptoms, physical symptoms were coming from out of mind. So it seemed like it was another self another location. And in, in Freud's own writings, he sometimes calls it another show place, right? There's another location where unconscious drives and desires are stored 
and they're being projected out into consciousness in this strange way. So, so the way that Freud developed uh, psychoanalysis, so psyche is soul, so soul analysis. So, so how would you analyze or break down or deconstruct someone's soul, someone's psyche, so that you can understand its structure and then restructure that psyche in a way that relieves their symptoms, right? That's what psychoanalysis does. Breaks down the structure or comprehends the structure of one's um, uh, uh, psyche, right? The conscious and unconscious structure. And then, um, again, reconstructs it in such a way that symptoms are alleviated for the patients. So his basic uh, technique was, uh, was the talking cure. So Freud, uh, very importantly, would remain out of sight of his patient. He didn't look at them. He didn't really talk to them that much. The patient would lay in a kind of somnambulant state, state sort of quasi-sleeping state, right? He actually used hypnosis early on. Uh, so, so the idea was you would kind of dim consciousness. And as consciousness dimmed, the unconscious spoke. So just to put it as, as bluntly as possible, maybe I can draw it here a little bit. So the way that this worked is the idea was that the conscious self, um, and the, uh, I'm misspelling that, aren't I? It's late at night, unconscious, yeah. So that the conscious self and the unconscious self are dialectically linked to each other and that they're, self, that they're mutually negating. They can't both be um, um, uh, in possession of the subject. So... Uh, Conscious, the conscious self dominates when the unconscious is negated and the unconscious dominates when consciousness is negated. So if you want to have access, full access to the unconscious, the only way to do it is to negate consciousness. So Freud's uh, first great book, The Interpretation of Dreams, his idea was is that when you go to, dr go to sleep, you dim your consciousness, you basically become unconscious, and then the unconscious part of the self speaks, and that's what dreams are, that the content of dreams are essentially uh, ideas and images and desires from the unconscious that find their way in, and it's at that moment, that kind of twilight zone, that liminal state between consciousness and unconsciousness that occurs in that, you know, in the when we wake up from a dream, right, or when we wake up in the morning. That's when we can get these little glimpses of the unconscious self, right? So, so, the, so, so, how, so you have to dim consciousness or shut it down in order to hear the voice of the unconscious, right? So it happens in dreams when we sleep. Um, another book that he wrote was The Psychopathology of Everyday Life. He analyzed jokes and what are called like Freudian slips little errors and mistakes that people make. You know, we say things that we don't intend to say. Uh, we trip and make uh, all kinds of physical blunders that we don't intend uh, to make. We're late for appointments that we really intended to be to. We make these slips. And he claims that that is uh, the unconscious speaking through in everyday life, that kind of thing. Um, let's see, the third book, um, so it's it's dreams. Yeah, oh yeah, dreams. Yeah, and yeah, sorry, the book on jokes, the jokes and the unconscious. So jokes are funny to us because we're often expressing unconscious desire in a joking fashion. So when you're joking, you're not really serious. So that's a kind of dimming of consciousness, an unseriousness that allows the unconscious to speak. I'm doing, um, I'm, I'm ripping that book to shreds there without being very fair to it. But his idea is, is that the moments when consciousness, the conscious self is dimmed, you can hear or speak to the unconscious. So hypnosis, you know, a lot of Iowa students go to a hypnotist um, uh, on prom night. And, uh, you know, apparently that's what a hypnotist does, right? It dims consciousness and then you become controllable. That the, that the, um, that in essence, in, in Freud's writings, in, in the book Ego, the um, uh, Mass Psychology, and the analysis of the ego, he claims that what a hypnotist does is places himself in the unconscious and controls the the behavior of the of the subject of, of hypnosis, uh, you know, through suggestion and so on. Um, so it can happen then, you know, if you're really drunk, I suppose it could happen. 
uh, you know, because you're basically in an unconscious state. You know, there are, there are psychoactive drugs. Uh, you know, the 1960s, LSD, um, you know, other forms of, of, again, psychoactive substances that essentially dim consciousness and um, allow for the expression of the unconscious. So these two things exist in a kind of dialectical relation. Most of us live our lives in a conscious, uh, in conscious self, a conscious brain. And so the unconscious is something that seems foreign to us. Um, and again, it comes out at dreams. Well, well, the somnambulant state of psychoanalysis, where the analysand, the person undergoing treatment, lays on a couch and, and uh, begins talking to Freud or some other psychoanalyst. Again, but the idea is to sort of relax the conscious self and to get the unconscious self to talk. So, so the way it works, I've got this little picture here. Um, you know, there, so so the idea is the the analyst remains out of sight and then becomes a blank screen for projection for projection, right? So here's so Freud. So here you're laying there on 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 the couch. You have the an analyst there out of sight, and what happens is is that the an an analysand, the person undergoing treatment, is given uh, the 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 primary rule. The fundamental rule is the complete and absolute honesty regarding fantasies, dreams, feelings, experiences. You can't repress or suppress. You can't have censorship. So you get an unfiltered projection of one's fantasies, desires, relationships, uh, and so on, the unconscious, uh, onto the an analyst. So the analyst becomes a blank screen onto which um, the unconscious is projected. Okay? So you get this... this, 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 this um, so then the, the analyst listens listens to the speech of the patient and attempts to sort of, again, kind of un, un, unpack the content of the, of the projected content uh, to understand the, the structure of the unconscious, to sort of trace the, the, uh, the traumatic experiences or the structural deficiencies or the basic faults that lay behind uh, the patient's symptoms. And then the goal is then to reconstruct uh, uh, the analysis and psyche and then to allow them to put the experience into words, to make the unconscious experience conscious, to put it to words, to be able to narrate um, this unconscious experience to the conscious self, at which point, uh, you know, it gets re-experienced and, and, uh, and dissolved. So the idea is, is that if you can take a traumatic experience that's causing symptoms and place it into um, the narrative sequence of one's life, the sort of biography of one's life, that the symptoms can dissolve at that point. And of course, he had great success with this. And we know, you know, right now, I, I've been, uh, I always talked about, um, you know, uh, a lot of the the body trauma treatments um, of the last sort of 30 years have really uh, confirmed a lot of what Freud was doing early on, that uh, the idea that the body keeps the score and, and Bessel van der uh, Kolk's um, language, the body keeps score, that there are symptoms that are being expressed in the body from traumatic experiences that the patient can't express. And that the psychoanalytic procedure, and now they're using body treatment and so on, the goal is to attempt to allow the patient to comprehend what happened to them and so that you can dissolve some of the body symptoms and some of the the unconscious behavior so so really um so what so what do you wind up with you wind up with a homo triplex model so in in uh durkheim's work we talked a little bit about durkheim emil durkheim um famously talked about humans as being doubled things where human duplex we're both a social self and an individual self. It's sort of our election on that. Um, Freud had a triplex model. So we thought that we were tripled. So let's really quickly go over what the triple is. Um, let's sort of put here. So this is the self, right? Um, now, in Freud's work, it's the, uh, the German is the ich, right? Uh, we would call it the I. The Latin is the ego, okay? So this is the self. And uh, let's divide the sort of natural self into two parts. We have the real self of embodied drives, of organic drives, of sensory experiences, is sort of unrepackaged, um, you know, direct perceptions and so on, right? So, so it's the self as real. Every animal 
every sensate being has something like a real self. In fact, even trees and other things have a real existence, right? So it's the real of biology. It's the real of illnesses, of sicknesses, of actual, you know, of, of, uh, of, of germs and so on. We're in the middle of a pandemic. So it's when, when, the, when the virus hits you, it, take, you know, it takes you over. It has really nothing to do with your consciousness. This is one of the foolish parts of the resistance to social distancing and any attempt to, um, to limit community transmission of disease. It's silly. Uh, the idea that, that I can will it away or because I say it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist, or because a particular political party doesn't believe in the germ theory of, of disease or something, it doesn't exist. No, no, no. Uh, Freud would say that the real, that the real, you know, the part of the self that's real, the part of the psyche, the soul that's real is going to be affected nevertheless, right? Okay. And then the real uh, has all kinds of drives and stuff. And then you've got what Freud is going to call uh, the imaginary. So the imaginary is really the realm of fantasy and of, of sort of, um, we're, we're going to call it a kind of pre-verbal or extra-verbal experience. It's going to be the, the world of, of um, let's say, um, nonverbal communication. Uh, it's, it, 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 it's the part of the self that you know, as childhood, when a child senses either comfort or safety or danger when in the presence of someone they don't know, when you get that kind of sixth sense about someone when you meet them, uh, that they may or may not be kind or friendly or decent or something like that, right? Or when you enter a situation, you get all kinds of, of, of signals that are very hard to interpret. So, so when you're looking at the world and you're, 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 you're sensing things or seeing things, um, and so on. Or, you know, when you're really, really hungry, you look out in the world and everything looks tasty. When you're really, really cold, you look out and you're, you're imagining comfort, something like that. Or let's say that you're really feeling deprived and neglected and that that sense is going to be shot out into the world and you're going to see it. So this is important. Freud is going to tell us that the real self and, and, and the imaginary self are interconnected and that oftentimes... Um, organic drives and desires and so on are projected out into the world. And what we see as real isn't the world as it is. What we see as real is some strange overlay of the world as it exists in a kind of objective way as filtered by or as overlaid by uh, uh, fantasy projections. So I really think that the concept of the projector is useful here. So um, uh, when you're using a projector, um, the, the, the thing that you're projecting onto gets kind of effaced or obliterated, and the images that come out of the projector are projected on top of them. You've seen this. Uh, I, I do it all the time in class where I'll accidentally walk in front of the projector that is projecting something like the PowerPoint presentation, and I'll walk in front of it, and suddenly the PowerPoint will be obscured behind me, and things will be projected onto my body surface and my face. So my face gets obscured and instead I get the projection uh, coming instead. I've always wanted to actually have a, a, my own face being projected onto the screen and then I have me walk in front of it and carefully position my face at the same place as the projection, at which point I and the fantasy would become the same, which would be kind of a cool thing to do. At any rate, um, so, so, so we have two parts of the self the real and the imaginary. But Freud is going to tell us that, that there is something else that's going to go on here, that this dividing line between the conscious imaginary self and the kind of unconscious world uh, or, or extra conscious world or not necessarily conscious world of the, of the organic drives and the real and so on, that this, this, whatever this mechanism is that blocks the perception from the body to the self, right? That requires an externalization onto the world in the form of fantasy. That this is always something um, that is symbolically structured. Let's put it another way. It is socially constructed or manufactured, right? So it's coded as a language. And this is really, Jacques Lacan really, the, the French psychoanalyst really helped explain this to people who had missed it the first time. 
that in Freud's uh, three great early books, the book on dreams, the book on jokes, and the book on Freudian slips and, and, and uh, psychopathology of everyday life, he keeps arguing that, that, that the unconscious, right, the part of the self that is some sort of bizarre mix of organic drives, unconscious fantasies, and, and language, and, 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 and social, um, uh, you, you know, envy, and all kinds of things, is something that is structured like a language. And so whatever the forces are um, that are driving certain things out of consciousness into the unconscious, out of the conscious mind into the unconscious, that this is going to be something that is social. And it's going to be structured like a language, and we know that language is always something that is structured by society. So Lacan, uh, as Freud, was reading a lot of social science and sociological theory. Freud, we know, read Durkheim, actually, when he was writing uh, uh, this book, and, and, and later, at least later books anyway. We, we know Freud read Durkheim. I don't know that Durkheim read Freud. Um, and so we know that, that, that Freud was thinking about the unconscious as something that is fundamentally structured by society. And that's what the book Totem and Taboo is all about. It's a book about the three parts of the self, right? The ego, the I, right? The ego, which is the conscious self, uh, right? The real self, which is the or organic drive and the sensory apparatus and so on. And then this bizarre complex of of um of 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 codes that are essentially determined by society so that the unconscious of the self is always something that is structured in the same way that a language is structured yes it has individual components to it but in the end in the same way that the language that you speak and the language that i'm speaking are socially constructed. I didn't make up English. You didn't make up English. I didn't make up the laws of grammar. You didn't either. But we nevertheless both use them unconsciously, right? That there's some sort of language program running in the background, right? That allows you and I to communicate to each other symbolically using uh, the, the, you know, the symbol systems of language. And that that is what is social, right? So the unconscious self is structured by society. It has the structure of language. It isn't that each individual's unconscious is society in them, but it works that way, right? So there's something like a collective unconscious, uh, which is the thing that I believe most sociologists are studying, the collective unconscious, the social structure that determines a life that's not in mind, it's not part of the myth or anything like that of our time or of our world, but it nevertheless structures us. So we know that Karl Marx, for example, was studying the collective unconscious in the form of value, right? He was trying to understand how the social jelly was being extracted from human beings and was being, um, was, was essentially being um, uh, absorbed into these externalized projects onto which human beings then projected, uh, uh, you know, uh, fetish meanings, right? So the same sort of thing. So you're hooked up to some device, it's sucking out your energy, and it's being structured by society. That's what value was. Remember that? It was the value was being structured by society. And when it appears in the form of another commodity, you can see it, and it seems to have this magic force radiating from it. So the human being then is tripled. You have the ego, we'll use the common terms, the super ego, um, and the real, right? So the real is sort of the, the, the organic and sensory apparatus, right? Um, the ego is essentially the, the conscious self, and the super ego is the unconscious part of the self that is always structured by society. But we'll just use the shorthand. It isn't quite exactly right, but we use it. It's society and the self. It's basically the way it comes across in this book. Okay? So there you go. So we experience reality. It's actually always a combination of three, three, three things. It's always a, a biologically and organically and chemically and physically real thing. Um, it's always shaped by our, 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 our imagination, our fantasies, and so on, but those are being shaped by the structure of the unconscious, repressions, and so on. So that's Freud. So then really quick here, so in Totem Taboo, he's going to be analyzing what he calls a Roker, <laughs> I'm going to have to use a fake a, a, a pronunciation of this, but folk psychology, social psychology is what he's interested in here. 
And, and what's at play in this book are all four of the major Freudian concepts that Jacques Lacan thinks are foundational. He's going to be talking about the unconscious, right? So the unconscious then is the part of the self that isn't available to consciousness, that stands in that dialectical relationship to consciousness, right? So the conscious self can only um, be accessed when the unconscious is dimmed. Or put it, let's put it another way. The way that, and this is technically accurate to Freud, consciousness gets structure. Consciousness has meaning. Consciousness has coherence because content that would otherwise be in the mind is forced or repressed into the unconscious. So repression then, which is our second concept, is, uh, excuse me, repression, excuse me, repression is the force that creates uh, um, the content of the unconscious. And the structure of repression is something that comes to us from society. It's going to come to us from two things that Freud is going to say is important. It's going to come to us from something called a totem here, um, which is a positive um, object of, of ambivalence and taboo, Oh, actually, we'll just say, we'll use Freud all the way. Totem can be both positive and negative, and in Freud's work, it's always both. Although you can have totems that are consciously positive, gods and heroes and so on, and consciously negative, demons, devils, um, uh, villains. But he is going to argue in the second chapter that you always feel ambivalence towards them. So even a po the most positive thing you can imagine, a god or a hero or a loved one, you always have unconscious hate for them and vice versa. The most, unconsciously, the most consciously hated villain or devil, you also have unconscious love for. So he claims it's always going to be ambivalence. And so the totem, it, whatever, the, whatever the valence is, in consciousness, the opposite is going to be an unconscious. That's chapter two. And then taboo refers to the law. It's going to be the commands, uh, the great no, right? The great no's of the world. So the no's are going to tell us, it's going to pretty, pretty much tell us where the dividing line, where these sort of little um, um, portals are that allow content to flow back and forth between the conscious and the con unconscious. You know, there won't be many of these, but it, the structure of, of taboo, the structure of no's, the structure of law, the structure of morality is what is going to determine, um, again, what, go, what, what gets repressed into the unconscious and then, um, and then what the portals are that allow it to come up. And so totem and taboo is what determines this, this, this agency that structures the unconscious, right? That, that controls what gets leaked into the conscious self and what gets repressed into the unconscious, okay? All right. Now, Freud is going to tell us that the things that wind up in the unconscious aren't lost forever. They're still there. We just lack a conscious memory of them. So in the words of Bessel van der Kolk, right? The body keeps score. The unconscious keeps score. And so the things that are repressed under the unconscious, the desires, the love, the hate, um, the memories, the traumas, whatever, um, that are there, and we get, we have coherence, we're able to function in everyday life, you know, um, you know, the structural model of, of dissociation um, that's contemporary and, you know, in clinical psychology, you know, the, the idea would be that you have an everyday functioning self, an apparently normal self. For that to have coherence, you have to have a whole bunch of content in repressed into the unconscious, right? All right, so so the things that are repressed come back, right? So this is called the return of the repressed, right? Uh, it's the title of one of my uh, papers, actually, the repressed returns, I think, right? The things that are repressed in the unconscious return. That's what a symptom is. That's what a psychological symptom is or a somatic, psychosomatic symptom is. You've repressed something into the unconscious and it appears again as a body symptom or it appears again as a strange behavior or it appears again in your dreams. It appears as slips of the tongue. It appears in the particular jokes that you keep telling and laughing at, right? And it comes out in hypnosis and so on. It comes out, though, in everyday life. and it comes So, so the repressed return. So you don't get rid of things that are repressed under the unconscious. 
And the things that are in the unconscious, especially the feelings of hate and love that are in the unconscious, get transferred or can be transferred, do get transferred uh, in the words that, uh, that Freud uses. They get displaced, displacement onto something else. So this is what happens in, in the psychoanalytic uh, treatment process. The patient begins projecting unfiltered, unconscious content. And what the analyst does is place themselves, again, as a blank screen, and they become a, uh, another show place where the earlier feelings of love and hate that the patient had experienced towards um, particular others in their life or their ex- uh, period, you know, experiences of trauma and so on uh, get re-experienced in the relationship that the patient has with the analyst. So the analyst becomes a, tr- the, the, the early uh, patterns of love and hate, the early relationships of love and hate get transferred onto the current relationship uh, with the analyst. By the way, this is how love works, according to psychoanalysts, is that the earlier experiences of love and hate in your early childhood uh, wind up getting projected onto uh, your current partner, that kind of thing, right? Okay, so transference or displacement, that the things that were originally caused by thing one, right, wind up uh, getting repressed, and then they reappear, transferred onto thing two, okay? And we're going to find out that that process is really important. In the second chapter, he's going to tell us that the hatred that we feel towards a totem, right, are wind up going to be transferred onto something else, right? We're going to project it onto something else, some demonic force out in the world, right? So the things that we repress into the unconscious don't stay there. They repeat, and they often get transferred or displaced onto something else. And drive is going to be our last concept, and this is going to be really important for Freud here. Drive refers to really um, uh, embodied, organic, um, um, you know, ten, uh, needs of the human subject, right? Drives often get colored by fantasy structures as desire, but drive is really this thing. You have the death drive, which comes later, but you have a drive for food, a drive for uh, for comfort. There's a sex drive or a variety of sex drives, a sociability drive. You're looking for to, to be around other people. And that these drives are sort of the, um, uh, again, they're kind of like the source of energy or the way that the human subject transmutes physical energy of the ape into something like the social energy of, of, of the human being. So, you know, we always remain underneath, right? Whatever else is going on with us, underneath we remain uh, beings of drive. So the real self of drive down here, right? The real self, this is the energy source, the energy pump that winds up fueling uh, the projection of, of, of fantasies and so on out into the world that shapes the way that we see the world and that determines, again, the way that we interact with the world outside as structured by uh, the unconscious, right? The way that repression finds itself out. So Freud is going to tell us in his first chapter that there's a drive for love of the mother that winds up getting repressed, and then it gets transferred onto other people, including the mother-in-law. And so that drive is there, and the mother-in-law would be the object of the drive, if not for conscious uh, repression. So that the conscious rules of avoiding the mother-in-law are in place to prevent the drive from leading one into a violation of a taboo, right? So that's always there. So I love this book because it covers all four of the big ideas, the four major Freudian concepts that Lacan writes about in one of his great uh, uh, seminars, right? So the consciousness... The conscious self, the ego, the I, let's call it the conscious self, not consciousness, and the unconscious self that um, the, are, 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 are dialectically related to each other. There are these little portals. I kind of like to think of them as a lens for projection, like a, like, you know, a camera lens, right? And that the unconscious is always both collective and individual, but the structure that it has is social. It's always social. It's always collective, right? The structure of the unconscious is going to be collective, right? Okay. So think of that these little portals as kind of like little projector lenses uh, that allow for unconscious content to find its way out into uh, perception of, uh, uh, in, of, of the conscious self, okay? 
drives find their way through in the same way, okay? All right, so psychoanalysis then and the process and praxis of life forces us, subjects or patients, to deal with the real through the symbolic. So the real drives that we have, we have to cope with as they are structured by the unconscious. So the way that our consciousness deals with, copes with, makes sense of, makes meaning out of our drives is, uh, is structured by society through the unconscious. Okay, so that pretty much gets us where we need to go. Um, okay, so then the two big key concepts of this book. So again, to take it as a nutshell, Freud is trying to understand the way that societies are really systems of totems and taboos. Totems and taboos. Simple societies have a single totem and a single list of tattoos um, that are apparently authorized by the totem, okay? And more complex societies develop multiple totems uh, with multiple sets of taboo uh, restrictions, right? Okay, but totem and taboo are basically the warp and the weft, the building block of, of society, or at least the, the, you know, that make up the fabric of society, something along those lines. So totem then is this object of veneration, or it could be an object of fear, but let's just go with, with veneration at the moment. And taboo refers to the, the laws, especially the great nose, right? The, that, that, that are um, uh, promulgated by uh, the totem or that apparently are promulgated by them. Okay, so let's go really fast. The totem is simply a representation, a collective representation of the group's absolute spirit. What does that mean? That means that any society has to have a way of seeing itself. We've already talked about that, right? And that the way that a society sees itself, we've said, uh, as a society can't see itself directly. It can only see itself, as we've already sort of talked about uh, in, in the Durkheim lectures, it can only see itself um, as a totem, right? Or a god or, uh, or some other collective agency or collective representation. So the members of society get together. They, they, let's say that their faces here are shining <laughs> with the reflected light of a totem. But the totem is lit. So let so imagine again this reflective surface, the totem, the God thing, the uh, graven image in the Old Testament, the molten gold that is formed into a calf in the Old Testament, right? That this thing shines with magic power, but the light that shines upon it that is then reflected back into the faces of the believers comes from their own drives. And those drives, that energy of the drive is then, again, the way that it is shaped, the way that it is projected outward, and the particular way that it is focused upon the totem is structured by society itself, okay? So let's put it bluntly. What a society is, at core, is a group of human beings, a group of primates, who come together to shine the energy of drive as transmuted by the great rules of totem and taboo, of laws that say no the great totems, right? So the great totems come into existence. The first great totems, the first great collective representations come into existence through the two great taboos. So you get a group of human beings who somehow or other are captured by society, who fall into society, right? And as they fall into society, they then um, uh, become aligned into an energy structure that animates a god or a totem, gives it energy, and then act as though that totem were real and thereby continue to obey uh, the taboos. So the totem gets worshipped and is venerated and, as well as feared, and the taboos are, uh, are honored um, and violators are punished, and that's what a society is. So a society at core is a group of people who come together in the collective worship or the collective honoring, the collective veneration, of a representation that the group honors as its own. And what we're going to be talking about in the tribes of Australia, these were totems. So these are all animal figures or figures of wind or air, nature, usually animals. And the animal is viewed as the kind of God, the collective ancestor and the God, the protector of the group. So the group comes together and shines its driving light, right, onto the animal or the representation of the animal that then again structures their life through the rules of honoring the totem and of avoiding uh, uh, the taboo items that the, the totem outlines.
That's what a society is. It's a group of people structured to honor a totem and to avoid tabooed objects. To honor a totem and to obey the laws of taboo. To honor a totem, to honor a god or a godlike thing, and to obey the laws of the god, something like that. Not your god. Your god's the right one, okay? So whatever god you grew up with, whatever church you were in, that's the right one. But everybody else's god, you can analyze this way, right? Everybody else's god is the god that is a god that is socially constructed and that, again, results from the uh, projection of the energy of drive as distorted through the symbolic uh, repressive apparatus uh, onto a totem that is then experienced as real that then leads to greater veneration and greater obedience, right? So that's what it is. So totem and taboo are the two great building blocks of society. A totem, again, is a representation of the group's spirit, usually an animal projected as a common ancestor or protector of the group. Uh, think of like... like um, Harry Potter's uh, Patronus. That was like an individual animal that protected each individual <laughs> magician, I suppose, in the Harry Potter world. And a totem is a collective one. So imagine like if all of the people in Hufflepuff or something, or all of the people in, um, you know, uh, Ravenclaw or something like that, had a particular totem animal that they then uh, were, were uh, worshiping or that protected them. They worshiped it and it protected them and gave them laws and so on. So the Totem becomes the focus of the ritual life of the group. In other words, when the group comes together, it comes together in the name of the totem, right? That's the reason why they exist. That's the reason why we're members of the same society. We are no we're members of the same society because we're all children of the totem, right? So totems exist wherever there are taboos. So this is important. To Freud, you can't have totems without taboos. You can't have gods without laws uh, and without the punishment of those who violate the laws. You can't have taboos, on the other hand, without totems, right? So taboos exist where there's totems, and totems exist where there's taboos. These two things are fundamentally linked together. Hence, again, if you don't if you don't believe me, just look at the title of the book, Totem and Taboo. Okay. All right, so that's what a totem is. A taboo then are prohibitions against actions and contacts, touching usually, that are considered sacrilege by the groups. So sacrilege, sacred, law, sacra, sacred, law, lege, law, um, ultimate or absolute crime, right? So violators are subjected to punishment, usually very, very serious and suffering. That's automatic. Often there's something called taboo sickness that Freud writes about, where you, as soon as you violate a taboo and you become aware of it, you su suffer and die. But often groups don't leave it to that. Societies don't. So there's something like collective punishment of those who violate uh, the, the, the taboo. The taboo is contaminating. Those who violate the taboo themselves become taboo. So it becomes very infectious. So if a member of your group violated a taboo, they become taboo and they infect you and all the other members of the group as well. It's, it's fundamentally impure. And what will happen is that the totem will stop protecting you and will stop being, uh, you know, the, providing the rain and the sun and so on um, if you violate the rules. So everybody's contaminated. So the goal then, the only way you get rid of the taboo violation, the impurity of the taboo violation, is through, um, you know, a puracular ritual of some kind, expiation, ritual purification, right? And so generally that means killing or punishing the offender. And by doing that, or even collectively in going through some sort of purification ritual, Lent, for example, right? That this, uh, that this then purifies you and restores you to good grace with your totem. Well, there are two universal totems, as Freud writes about in the first chapter. Thou shalt not eat or kill the totem or the totem animal. And thou not, shall not have sexual relations with the women of one's totems, okay? So don't touch the women of the totem, the totem's women, and don't um, eat or kill the totems. Really don't touch the totem except in, in great respect, okay? All right, so the primary case that he looks at then is the case of the Arunta uh, people, Arunda people of, of Central and Northern Australia. I guess I'm actually not quite sure where they really are located, but this comes from the work of Spencer and Gillen. Um, I won't go into great detail about these folks right now. We'll probably save it for a Durkheim lecture later. But the key idea of them is that these are groups that were divided into totems. They weren't strictly clan or kin groups, but they were totem groups. All right? 
So the totems then are, uh, are again, are essentially these spirit things. People believe themselves to be the child of the totem. They may well recognize a biological father, but their spiritual father is the totem. So I am a witchetty grub because the witchetty grub is my father. I am a, um, a grass snake because I'm the grass snake or carpet snake, as Mark Orr likes to point out, uh, is my father, that kind of thing. So you get a full identification um, with that particular uh, totemic spirit. Uh, and then that is usually in some sort of structural alignment with others. So some totems, um, uh, because this is the thing, because you cannot touch the women of the totem as a man, and if you're a woman, you can't touch the men of the totem, uh, you can't reproduce unless you have a second totem. So as uh, Freud writes about, there's always two. There's always more than one. There's got to be more than one. Um, and so totems begin trading uh, um, goods, rituals, women, sex, and so on, all right? All right, so the key thing is, is that you're born into one particular totem, and that shapes your life. Large chunks of your life, then, are lived within your totem, and it overwrites whatever you're born into. So children can be born into a different totem than either one of their parents, um, and that, therefore, at a certain age, they're going to be ripped at the age of initiation, right? They're going to be ripped away from uh, their childhood home from their mother, basically, or mother er, and then they're going to be installed as a member of the totem of their father, their spiritual father, right? So you get, uh, let's go to human triplex. So in Dirk, uh, excuse me, in, in Freud's terms, at birth, you're going to be born uh, in the real as an infant, a biologically real thing, and you're going to engage in extensive interaction with a, with a set of mother errs. This is going to be whoever it is who takes care of you in most societies. The mother knows who their child is, so the mother has a kind of biological relationship to the child where the father doesn't. The father is always the social attribution, but the mother has this kind of extra of also being uh, biological. So you have this kind of intensive interaction, mother-child, as the child grows, and that, that develops then. Um, so you have the biological birth of the human being occurs on the day they're born. The psychological birth of the human being occurs during that process of intensive dyadic interaction between the mother-ers and the child, the infant. Uh, usually when the child knows its name, knows its mother's name, uh, has a, a relatively stable sense of self and so on, that that all comes around then. And then at the age of initiation, always by puberty or maybe pre-puberty, you get the social birth of the human being. Uh, and that's when you have these in, in, immense initiation rituals, right? In America, you know, it's usually when you go to school. Uh, that often corresponds to some religious ritual uh, as well, First Communion or something like that, or some sort of, um, uh, uh, you know. So, so, so you go to school, that's your main initiation, where you're ripped away from your mother and installed. Uh, you're socially born when you go to school, right? That's your social birth. You get a new name often. Uh, new set of authority, and a new set of laws. You get a new set of, uh, of totem laws and prohibitions. And one of the prohibitions usually is you can't have your mother back and you can't have uh, your home back in the same way. You can never go home again, right? That door is closed. Okay, so there you are. So they spent about a third of their life in totem uh, life. We can leave that there. Um, uh, Freud uses uh, the term primitive and savage. Uh, he doesn't really mean disgusting racist or, or, or anything like that, or pejoratively. It, it, there are those meanings that come out, but I want you to think about it primarily as a descriptor. Uh, and what he means by primitive is primary, that these are some of the least developed uh, social groups we know. So their technology is particularly uh, um, um, spare, to use the term that I used in a previous uh, video, Um they have no clothing to speak of, uh, very little permanent shelter, uh, none actually. They have very uh, little food preparation. They don't have pots and pans. At, at, they often just essentially eat raw food or read anal, eat animals that have just been sort of thrown on a fire, uh, pick the poo and other things away from the meat and chew away. Um, and uh, yet they have, so despite that lack of technology, they nevertheless have this really elaborate social life and these highly elaborate um, uh, prohibitions against intertotemic sexual relations. In fact, as 
Freud will tell us, much of their life is actually structured around the avoidance of sex with people who aren't in your totem. Okay? All right. Uh, so the collective consciousness then of these people and the collective unconscious is brought by about these elaborate rituals to avoid incest and to honor the totem. Those are the two things that they tend to do. Okay. All right. So uh, shall let's take a look very quickly, if we can, at these people. So, um, so this is some images from Spencer and Gillen. I won't go into great detail on these, but uh, the Alunta people have been living in Australia, essentially outside of Western contact until, you know, the 18th century. And so, uh, you know, these tribal peoples, uh, these totem peoples, um, again, had these strong identifications with the totem animal during moments of initiation and group ritual. They would literally overwrite their identity with that of their totem. So they would paint on, I don't know which one this is, I'm sorry. Let's say this is a turtle totem. I'm not sure that it is, but let's say this is a turtle totem. Uh, the turtle totem is drawn on the ground. There's usually a sacred object, maybe even bone of the turtle ancestor or something that's placed in the ground. And then the, the garb, the symbolic representation of the turtle is placed on all of the members of the turtle uh, totem. And then there are all of these rituals that honor the totem uh, that go on. So then there's all these different kinds of totems. There's a whole bunch of them, like 60 or more uh, different totems. Um, that interact with each other in really complex ways. Some you're allowed to have sexual relations with, some you're not. Most you're not. So one of the things that Freud mentions at the beginning of the text is that there's really elaborate totem rules and these sub-rules called fray trees that are set up. These rules about who you're able to have sex with or not. So only about one out of four totem women uh, are available to you. None in yours and then none in, in three-fourths of the other uh, totems. So only one out of four totems can produce women that one that a man of one totem could be with, or vice versa, that a woman in one totem could only. Um, uh, so, so again, anyway, really, really elaborate ritual life again. It must have been amazing to come of age in one of these societies and to see the incredible um, identification of the members of the totem with their totemic animal and the way that the totem animal became real in ritual. And again, it must have been really impressive to see uh, uh, the members of one society going through these really elaborate rituals that reconstruct, you know, the life of their totem ancestor, that feed their totem ancestor, that honor their totem ancestor, uh, that ask it to help rain come and so on. Here's a bunch of different totems together at a ritual and that you can see the different totemic symbols on the back. So the totems come together you can't live alone as a totem. You have to have at least one other one, right? And and here they have these really really complex uh, systems, and you and again you're overwritten with it. So in the same way that you have a last name that identifies your family and a first name that identifies your individuality, here the psychological birth of the individual, your name became recognized with you, your early name, and then in the initiation ceremony you get a second name, a totem uh, name comes up. Uh, just to say they had a kind of odd notion of, of um, again, biological birth was one thing, but the psychological birth, the social birth, excuse me, the social birth of the human individual required uh, a spirit father, right? So the, this child's totem father uh, entered the mother um, before she was pregnant usually. So the belief was is that the spirits of the ancestors go looking for fat women. They like fat women, pregnant women basically, we now know, but they but they didn't think of it as already pregnant women. Instead, um, they, they go and they say they, they look for the moment when uh, they feel the quickening or they recognize that they're pregnant. And that's when they believe that the spirit of the ancestor, the totem ancestor, got up within them like the witchetty grub, got up in there somehow uh, when a woman who realized she's pregnant walks over uh, the witchetty grub um, uh, area. Yeah, and here's sort of a, a quick in image of the different classes of, of uh, totems. So this is a list of the different totems, some of whom you can um, mate with, basically, and some of which you can't. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so this is how, um, uh, yeah, the, she was fat, right? Yeah, the, the the spirit children, the little spirit children are running out there, spirit of the ancestor, basically looking around for a fat woman to crawl up inside of. Uh, and that's how the witchetty grub gets up in there. Yeah, they prefer those fat women. And that's the way that you deal with pregnancy, uh, biological pregnancy uh, versus spiritual pregnancy, social pregnancy. 
This, these are the Charingas. These are these magic objects that are um, uh, symbolic of the spirit ancestor and are used in rituals. Here's the initiate. So at the moment when the child, we'll go into more detail about this later, but at the moment when a psychologically born child, the child is say four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, has a developed sense of self and because they've been living with their mother -er, uh, then when they get initiated into their totem, there are several steps. This is for boys. Uh, they get thrown up. I'll show an image of that. They get thrown up by the group, thrown up, I mean, really, literally, where they could die or at least get seriously hurt. And they come down and are caught. Uh, then they get circumcised. Uh, it's actually sub-incision, not circumcision. Uh, that means that the, that the uh, phallus is actually cut uh, from top to stem, um, and rather than uh, around the out uh, to, to remove the foreskin, it's actually um, a way to sort of really seriously cut the uh, the phallus open. And the belief is is that you can't give birth to a spiritual child if you don't do this. There has to be some way for the spirit to get up into the child, and that's actually so. So 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 in many ways, the cutting open of the phallus creates a kind of womb opening so that the spirit of the totem can get up inside of the boy or re-enter that kind of thing or and can get back out during sexual uh, ritual and so on. Subincision is performed. They say circumcision does too. Anyway, uh, then you go through, you get your head bit and other things. Uh, so anyway, there's multiple stages to it. Again, here's, it must have been pretty impressive to see um, the men of your totem uh, coming at you uh, in full dress or when um, engaged in ritual performances uh, to reenact the life of the uh, totemic animal um, and so on. Um, yeah, here's, another, here's an image of uh, one of these Australian. I'll keep these back and we'll use these again. But at any rate, um, so at the moment of initiation, here is the teeth uh, getting knocked out of the initiate. Right, so there's always wounds that are made, and the wounds are always spiritual. So this is true yet today that social initiation, the social birth of the human subject, um, almost always requires some sort of physical imprint. Um, there used to be like moments of hazing that when you join a, an official club or group, uh, where you may not actually get cut open. Uh, although, like in German um, uh, um, drinking societies, you know, uh, collegiate drinking societies, you actually always did have to get cut open. Um, but there's always dubbing, beatings, um, you know, where you're actually getting a wound of some kind on you as a way to signify the spirit getting inside of you, that kind of thing. Uh, so there's teeth getting knocked out. Here's the child, uh, the initiate, getting thrown up uh, by the group. Um, again, it must have been amazing to go through these, these rituals. Here's another uh, instance of a tooth being knocked out. After, uh, here's the sub-incision ritual. Uh, where like the men of the totem, one lays on the ground, uh, or two of them lay on the ground, uh, several hold the boy down, and then here they're just using a sharp stone to uh, engage in the sub-incision ritual. Again, I'll hold those back. We'll use those again. And then after the sub-incision takes place, um, the men of the totem continue to reopen the wound to keep the wound uh, uh, from closing up and so on. So there was a lot of care taken um, uh, there. I'm going to stop this video here and then we'll come back and we'll jump right into uh, Freud. So this is all some of the preparatory work to, to the chapters of the book. Come right back.